Welcome everybody to Healthy Seminars. I'm your moderator, Lauren Brown. And today we got Dr. Carrie Jones, naturopathic doctor, giving a lecture today on talking about sex drive and hormones. How do you make a baby when you're not in the mood? And uh, we know during this time of isolation and stress, how stress can impact hormones. So I'm, I'm personally really looking forward to this lecture because Carrie always packs it full of good information. Um, before we get started, as usual, I'm going to just do a little bit of um, housekeeping here. So I'm going to share um, the screen and let you know that um, if you want to watch the recording of this lecture, um, you go to healthyseminars.com, go to our homepage, and you'll see the menu for resources. Um, go to resources, and then you come to this page. And if you can see, we have different categories here. However, the easiest is to go to the calendar right now. And you can see May 13th, if you click on this, it will take you to um, Carrie's talk, which is, um, my thing is blocking it. Let me move that out of the way. You will take you to here. And so this is where the recording will be, okay? I do wanna let you know that this webinar is brought to you by Precision Analytical. Um, and uh, we use that, uh, the Dutch test in our clinic. So I'm looking forward to learning more about it so we can benefit our patients even more so. On the resource page at healthyseminars.com forward slash resource, just to remind you, we are still adding resources for you. If you miss some of the resources that we've had in the past between um, starting in March and throughout April, now May, you can go to the calendar, click previous, et cetera, to get to the different month. And you can click on the link and if that replay is still available, um, you'll be able to find it right here from the calendar. So you can look at this calendar to see if any of these replays are available and you can see what we have coming. We do have a few more we haven't put in the calendar that will be added in May. So do come back to healthyseminars.com forward slash resources regularly. I want to let you know a little bit about Carrie. As you can see, we got her bio up here and she has a course on healthy seminars as well. So we know that Carrie can deliver because we've had her speak before in healthy seminars. She's internationally recognized speaker. Actually, she was supposed to do a talk similar to this at the Integrated Fertility Symposium in Vancouver and it got canceled. Luckily, I gave Carrie a little tap on the shoulder and she was like, yeah, I'll still do this for you guys. So um, thank you, Carrie, for doing that. Um, she's a consultant educator on the topic of women's health and hormones. She graduated from the, natural, uh, the National University of Natural Medicine. It's a school of naturopathic medicine in Portland, Oregon, where she completed her two-year residency in women's health, hormones, and endocrinology. She graduated from Grand Canyon University's um, with a master's of public health program with the goal of doing more international education. Check that box off. She's doing tons of um, international education on women's health. She was the adjunct faculty for many years at um, NUNM, teaching gynecology and advanced endocrinology and fertility. And she's been the medical director for two large integra integrated clinics in Portland. And she's also the medical director for precision analytic and analytical which is the creator of the Dutch test, which I'm sure she'll uh, mention as well as part of the testing for these hormone balances. I will let you know that Carrie has a course on healthy seminars, get out, understanding proper estrogen detoxification for phase one, two, three, and it's for three continued education credits. And you should know that um, all the courses on demand are on 25% off. So if we click on this discount coupon, it takes you below. We've extended that coupon until the end of May 31st because um, um, we're, a lot of us are in isolation and we were asked, can we put a coupon together? We had it for April and we extended it to May. So that is available for you guys, um, ongoing. Just a disclaimer before we, um, give uh, the controls over to Carrie and she starts to do her presentation. I do want to let you know um, that this is for educational purposes only. This is not meant to be medical advice or interpreted as medical advice. If you have a health condition, please seek out a qualified health provider. Again, this is for educational purposes only. Thank you for doing that. And again, in the spirit of community, unity, immunity, most of us have our cameras on. At the end of the webinar, um, Carrie will take questions. So raise your hand at the bottom if you have a question and um, we will give you mic rights if you like, and you can ask your question. And then at the very end, we're gonna open mics to connect with each other and give each other um, love and appreciation, especially for um, Carrie for putting together this talk and put, giving us the time today. And again, I mentioned we use this test at AccuBounce, so I'm really looking forward to learning how to use it on a, either, on a deeper level so we can help our patients with hormone imbalances. 
Can we bring up Carrie's PowerPoint? Or Carrie, you can share your PowerPoint, unmute yourself, and we're all ears. Guys, post your questions. Um, you can in the in the chat. However, if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll um, give Mike Grace to ask your question as well. All right. Can you, everybody, can, can you see it? You can hear, see it? You can hear me? All right. Thumbs up. Excellent. All right. Let me just minimize the box. So as you know, well, first of all, thank you so much to Lauren. Thank you so much to Healthy Seminars for having me once again. I had such a good time the first time for three hours talking about estrogen detox that we thought, why not jump back in with libido? How do you make a baby when you're not in the mood? So we're going to talk all about sex today and the hormones that are involved with sex drive. So let's get started. I know this was advertised as being more of a 60-minute webinar. I tend to pack a lot of information in, but it's good information and it's a lot of fun. So this might be more like an hour and 15-minute webinar for those of you who may have to go. Uh, as Lauren said, I am the medical director for Precision Analytical. We are going to talk some about the Dutch test. I'm going to introduce what the Dutch test is in the beginning, and then we will jump into the meat of it where I talk about all sorts of hormones and hormone imbalance. So let's first start out with Dutch. If you're not familiar with Dutch, it is an acronym. It stands for Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. And I have a comparison chart up here, what Dutch compared to serum, compared to saliva, depending if you are doing any kind of hormone testing in your practice, what your options are. The bonus of Dutch is that you get all the hormones you're used to, such as your estrogens, estradiol, progesterone, what have you. Uh, you get your cortisol, but you get what are known as metabolites. So you get the hormone and then you get where it's going. So you get the estrogen, but where does estrogen go through detoxification? You get that testosterone, but where does testosterone go? We're gonna, we're gonna talk about something like 5-alpha DHT. You get cortisol, but where does, where does cortisol go? How does it get metabolized? And then on top of that, we do add in some, some organic acids, B6, B12, glutathione, your dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine metabolite. We do an oxidative stress marker that's known as 8-OHDG and melatonin. Plus, for those women who struggle all through the month or throughout the month where they know certain days are a problem, we offer the cycle mapping. Again, just a few slides on Dutch. It looks like this. If you're doing dried urine, people will ask, how do you collect dried urine? You urinate on these pieces of filter paper, let them sit out for about 24 hours, fold them up, mail them back to the lab. They are collected four, if not five times through the day because we do want the full rhythm. When we do our combination, which is known as the Dutch Plus, this gives us the cortisol awakening response. We do a combination of the dried urine and salivate swabs. There are two ways to collect saliva that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You have the swab option and you have the tube option that requires spitting into a tube or drooling into a tube. When we're looking at the cortisol awakening response though, it must be collected very, very quickly. Those of you who are new to the cortisol awakening response, I will talk about it just for a second um, but it, it, in the next slide, but it has to be collected on waking 30 minutes later and 30 minutes after that. So if you're drooling into a tube, it can actually miss the cortisol awakening response. So what Dutch did, we switched to swabs that are just like the picture. They're like rolled up cotton. You stick them in your mouth, get them wet and uh, pop them back into the tube. It's the salivate swabs that we use. It's also the salivate swabs that they use in research when they're looking at cortisol awakening testing. So is there research regarding dried urine? There is. Those of you who are using serum or using saliva, we do have dried urine research that was published in 2019. In this study, they compared serum estradiol and progesterone in a menstruating woman and compared it against her estradiol and progesterone of dried urine and found that statistically correlates. And you can see the two graphs there with progesterone um, at the top and estrogen and estradiol at the bottom. Coming soon, though, we're hoping to have data published comparing salivary cortisol versus dried urine cortisol. And you can see on the graph as well, the saliva are in the hash lines and urine are in the solid lines. And there is statistical equivalence between the rise and fall in saliva and the rise and fall in cortisol throughout the day. Now, you might say, well, that urine is offset. It doesn't match 100% with saliva. That's true. It's a shifted view. And the reason for that is the waking cortisol in urine is actually representing the cortisol through the night. Because all that cortisol you make in the night ends up in your bladder. 
you urinated out the next morning. So the bonus of a dried urine uh, strip is that we can tell you what your cortisol is through the night. So if you have insomnia or you tend to wake up at three in the morning and then try to go back to sleep, we can give you some information on that. Or we can also have you collect at three in the morning and then collect again at six in the morning when you wake up and we'll give you both of those results as well. With the Dutch test, you collect first thing on waking and then two hours after waking, that's the reason for the shift compared to saliva because it's the two hours after waking that is the urine or excuse me, the cortisol made and put in the urine from the time you woke up until two hours later. So it's the same pattern, just shifted a little bit with urine. How do you choose the right test? We're gonna talk about three just really quickly. The Dutch complete all urine all, all the time. So there's four collections in the day for the circadian rhythm plus a fifth overnight collection that if you have insomnia, you look, we look at all the metabolites with the hormones. We look at cortisol and cortisone, which is inactive, melatonin, the 8-OHDG, and the nutritional and neurotransmitter metabolites. If you want to add in the cortisol awakening response, you would add in the Dutch plus. This is everything I just said on the complete plus. It includes saliva uh, salivate samples, where you're looking at um, cortisol first thing in the morning, 30 minutes later, 30 minutes after that, around dinner before bed, and if you wake up with insomnia. So with this one, it's a lot more collective or a lot more comprehensive collection, more data points. That's the bonus to this. So this is definitely a good test for that person who has a lot going on and needs a lot of data points, um, but it does require some extra collection. If you are new to the cortisol awakening response, I've outlined again what the collection looks like. Like I said, it is a few more data points. So the first collection is immediately on waking, then 30 minutes later, 30 minutes after that, or 60 minutes after waking. The reason for that is cortisol rises very quickly. As soon as your eyes open in the morning and light comes in, light is the trigger for the cortisol awakening response. This is where your cortisol shoots off in a healthy manner and increases at its most, hence the reason it's called an awakening response. It gets you awake. It also sets off a whole cascade of other beneficial health things. We do collect around dinner and again before bed because we want that full circadian rhythm. Why is the car important? What are those health things I was talking about? Well, other than energy levels, stress response and resiliency, which resiliency is so big right now is probably the key word that gets thrown around. It's very true. Levels of feeling stressed out. Your car is a great indicator of how alert you are in the morning. So if I ask you, how long does it take you to be alert in the morning? And you say, well, it takes me about two hours and two cups of coffee, then I know your cortisol awakening response is not that great. But if you tell me that you wake up and you feel pretty alert within about 30 minutes, that's normal. That's a normal cortisol awakening response. The car also has to do with blood sugar management. You've been fasting all night. You need that spike in cortisol to help you manage blood sugar. Remember, cortisol is known as a glucocorticosteroid. Gluco, because glucose is the number one thing cortisol manages. It's not stress. It's glucose. So if your blood sugar is not right, you will never get your cortisol right and vice versa. That awakening response affects mood. Do you wake up anxious, panicked? Do you wake up depressed? Do you wake up worried? It affects autoimmune development or progression. It affects your central tolerance in your thymus gland, not thyroid, but thymus gland. It affects inflammation, infection, memory and recall, and cancer outcomes. If you are listening to this lecture and tomorrow you're trying to think back and recall the things that I said and the pictures on the slides and you can't, my guess is you have a cortisol problem. This is the cycle mapping. This has a lot to do with fertility. So this is the perfect test for women who should uh, be cycling. This is my favorite test. I do this on myself. Uh, I fully understand hashtag perks of the job that I get to, but I do this on myself at least once a year. And what it does is it maps out your estradiol, estrone, and progesterone throughout the whole cycle. So if you have a woman that is struggling with infertility, she has hormonal symptoms that go from ovulation, before ovulation, after ovulation, around PMS time, um, she's like, I get migraines at specific days. I feel terrible on specific days. Maybe she has had an ablation or an IUD and she doesn't know like where she is in her cycle. This is a really great test, especially for these top three things. This is what I use it the most. 
women will are very specific sometimes. They're like on day 10, on day 13, on day 18, and on day 21 through 28, these are what happened to me. Or I get migraines on these days. And so by using the cycle mapping, we can really look at it. So let's dive into my objecti- objections, uh, objectives, not objections, I have no objection to libido, objectives about libido. Uh, we're really we're going to do, number one is our big thing, how multifaceted libido is for both men and women. This lecture started out primarily for women, um, just when it was with uh, the fertility symposium. And when I redid the slides, I decided to add in a whole lot more men's health because men are often forgotten and men are absolutely just as hormonal as women, they just don't like to admit it. So we're going to talk about men as well. Quick reminder on how to make a baby. There has to be a healthy egg. There has to be a healthy sperm. They have to meet at the proper time, do their thing, implant, and grow. And believe it or not, it's amazing to me, and I'm sure amazing to you, those of you who do quite a bit of fertility, uh, how many people get this wrong? (laughs) And how many people don't realize like how a sperm meets an egg and timing and cycle and all that. But what we're going to focus on is the libido aspect. So meanwhile, in my sex life, this is why your patients are coming to you, right? This is why your patients are like, well, I'd like to get pregnant, but I have no libido. I'm not in the mood. I can't get in the mood. Um, sex is painful. Uh, what's, what's going on? So let's talk about this. First and foremost, There are known as female sexual dysfunction. We're just going to start here. So lack of interest in sex, 27 to 32% of women unable to achieve orgasm, 22 to 28%. Pain during sex, 8 to 21%. And sex not pleasurable, 17 to 27%. This was in a 2009 study, which I realize is a bit outdated, but it's probably, you know, probably pretty... um, Current. I mean, I mean, as far as like, if you were to poll your patient, your female patients in your practice with low libido or libido issues, you'd probably get relatively the same percentages. So some of these, you know, like you probably talk about these day in and day out, and others of these um, may not. You may not realize. You may not register. So when we talk about libido. This meme comes up a lot, right? Man, you just flip the switch and he turns on. Whereas women, it's a complicated amount of dials. But as it turns out. That's absolutely not true. All genders experience issues with libido. I have men who struggle with libido for a myriad of complicated reasons, just as much as I have women. And I have women that just need to like literally push a button and they're in the mood. And I have other women that are, you know, really struggling and have been struggling for a while. So there's a wonderful book. It's known, it's called Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagoski. And she says, whatever you're experiencing in your sexuality, whether it's challenges with arousal, desire, orgasm, pain, no sexual sensations, it's the result, is the result of your sexual response mechanism functional appropriately, functioning appropriately in an inappropriate world. So you're normal. It's the world around you that's broken. And we're going to break this down a bit as it comes to our hormones and figuring out what your normal is and how we can work with that. So I always ask these questions when it comes to libido. Always, always. In my practice, I had no problem talking about sex with patients because I found sex to be a really good barometer of a lot of other issues going on. And it really gets to the heart of a lot of matters. And not a lot of practitioners are willing to talk about sex and not a lot of patients are going to bring it up. They're too embarrassed. So I would ask these questions to my men and my women. Number one, is this a problem for you? This gives you really great feedback. They come in, I have low libido. You go, all right, is this a problem for you or is this a problem for your partner? And you get really interesting answers, right? Is this a problem for you? If they're like, well, not really, but my partner's really upset. Like, ooh, okay, it's not a problem for you, but they're, the, they're concerned. Or you'll have people who are like, yeah, it's an absolutely huge problem. I want my libido back. Where did it go? So it kind of gives you an insight as to their relationship issues, right? Which has a lot to do with, with libido. Number three, are you still attracted to your partner? Now, I'll be honest, when I've asked this question absolutely multiple times, I will say, are you still attracted to your partner? And I'll get this. Um, and they'll kind of look to the side and like think about it. <laughs> like, okay, that's not necessarily hormones. I'm not really sure I can fix that. That's I suggest maybe some relationship counseling, something maybe beyond. I mean, this is this is not testosterone. <laughs> I think we need to work on some other stuff. But what you will find is a lot of times your patients will say, Yes, I'm very much attracted to my partner. I love my partner. I am just not in the mood. Okay, let's talk about did you have a sex drive in the past? 
Was it high and now it's low or gone? Or was it low and now it's very low or gone? Why do I need to know this? Because I want to know how much do I have to move the needle? If you were always a 10 before and now you've dropped to a one, well, that's nine points, right? That I have to, I have to move you. But if when you were like, well, I've never really had a high sex drive. I was always like a four out of 10, but now I'm a th- one or a zero. I'm like, okay, that's th- three points or four points I have to move you to get you back to what's normal for you. And so the person who fell from a 10 to a zero, I have a lot more work to do than the person who fell from like a four to a one. And so I always ask this, and it gives me a good idea of what's normal for them because my idea of a, of a libido and their idea of a libido can be very, very different. And I want to meet their needs, not my needs. Next question, can you reach orgasm or could you in the past? This has a lot to do with hormones. This has a lot to do with sensation. This has a lot to do with um, trust, stress, what's on their mind. There's a lot that goes into orgasm, trauma, surgery. And so you want to ask these questions. And lastly, does sex hurt? Because if they say yes, it absolutely hurts. Male or female, men can have painful um, ejaculation. Then they're not going to want to have sex no matter how in the mood they are. It's never any fun if it hurts, and you have to get that evaluated. Other factors involved, of course, lots. We're going to talk about some of this when it comes around to hormones. So arousal, um, are their needs being met, their love language. If you're not familiar with love language, um, that's definitely one of my favorites. Uh, Stress and sleep and hormones, we're going to talk about sex hormone balance, thyroids, neurotransmitters, history of trauma or abuse, self-esteem and body image, history of negative sexual experiences, lifestyle choices such as alcohol, drugs, or smoking, disease states, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, medication, side effects, et cetera, et cetera. So the libido, when they say libido is is complicated, they're not kidding. Libido can absolutely be complicated because all of these play a big role for the average person. But I will say if pain is the problem, please absolutely get it evaluated. Um, looking at this list, you know, asking about past or current trauma history. This is this slide is more around male, or excuse me, females, because I had the most experience with females. Male pelvic pain, male pain with ejaculation, uh, is definitely not my area of expertise. But if he's reporting that, please refer him and get him worked up for that. But for females, you know, refer or perform a pelvic exam, evaluate her pelvic floor muscles, evaluate for vaginal dryness and atrophic vaginitis, especially as women get older into perimenopause and menopause or women who've had amenorrhea for a long period of time. Now, I realize this lecture is a lot about like, how do you make a baby? But for sure, this applies to the menopausal woman as well. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, take libido off the table just because, um, you know, she's menopausal, despite the topic of this lecture. Consider testing for yeast, bacteria, sexually transmitted infections, considering pap tests with HPV. Be on the lookout for lichen sclerosis. That's where the tissue gets very thin and white. Um, Ask about personal care that could be irritating the vaginal or labial tissue. It's amazing the number of women that that are still using powders and wipes and creams um, and and sprays and, and things that they think is important for their vaginal care and probably isn't given all the fragrance and chemicals in it. And lastly, of course, assess for endometriosis. So let's jump into sexual desire and sexual arousal. Dr. Nagoski talks about the dual control method, but it was developed out of the Kinsey Institute. If you don't know about the Kinsey Institute, I recommend you look up the Kinsey Institute. So it's the central mechanism that determines sexual arousal or not. So it's your accelerator and your brake to determine if you're aroused and responsive or if you can be. So what's really neat about this is just like you have a sympathetic and parasympathetic for your central nervous system, you have one for sex as well, which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, when we think about accelerator and brake. So what's known as the SES is the sexual excitation system. Basically, it's, your, it's, it's the it's fight or flight, right? It's the sympathetic part of your central nervous system, but it's for your libido. So this is your accelerator. It's the system that responds to sexually relevant stimuli in the environment from visual stimuli to tactile stimuli and everything in between. So what pushes on your accelerator? This is your sexual excitation system. We want to know what gets you aroused or in the mood. And if it's, if you say, well, it takes a lot, it takes a lot to get me aroused or in the mood, or you might say, well, I can, once I get in the mood, I'm there, right? It's just, I hit, I can hit the break really. Like the littlest thing can throw me off. 
That's the break. Let's talk about the break, the sexual inhibition system. This is the system that scans for threats. Anything that affects what you see, hear, touch, smell, taste, or imagine that keeps you turned off, distracted, or not interested, such as avoiding STD, or excuse me, STIs, avoiding pregnancy, social consequences, worry. It's also the break system related to performance. So for um, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, inability to orgasm, pain, body image issues, or especially for people who are looking to become pregnant and all of a sudden sex becomes, we have to make a baby and it's no longer fun. Now, the break can be other things as well. The break can be things like you had a very stressful day. You still have a lot to do. The dishes are piled up in the sink. You haven't done laundry yet. The kids are driving you crazy. Any little thing that your partner does that you were in the mood and then they did that thing and now you're super irritated, the break, the break has been hit. So this feeling, this feeling of, you know, if you see this, uh, <clears throat> pandemic, right? COVID, it does not help libido, libido. So if you are feeling this way day in and day out, it's definitely going to throw the brake system more than you want, and it's not going to put you in the mood. So the SCS and the SIS have different levels of sensitivity. How sensitive are your accelerator and your brake independently? So if you have an extra sensitive uh, SIS, you have an extra sensitive brake system that may require more trust, more relaxation, less distraction, less worry than somebody else. You know what I mean? So you may be completely distracted. You have too much on your mind, too much on your plate. You're worrying. And so it takes a lot or Herculean effort to get you to relax enough to actually want to have sex. Somebody else who has a low sensitivity of the excitation system requires more stimulation to actually get in the mood, but once they're there, they're there. So they don't, they don't have breaks. Their, their break isn't the problem. Like they're, them being stressed or the kids or the dishes or we're, none of that's the problem. They're just like not generally in the mood. But once they get stimulated, once things are positively happening in the right direction, they're like, oh, I can get there. It just takes me a minute. And so you have to evaluate these separately. When you're looking at this, figuring out what increases the excitation system, what pushes on the accelerator, and what lets the foot off the brake, right? We want to decrease the brake. And context is super important for both. I get asked this all the time from patients. Why did I have no problems with sex and libido at 21, but now at 41, I can't get in the mood and I have lost all desire? How many of your patients have asked you that? How many times have you thought that if you're like struggling with libido? How many times have you thought, geez, when I was younger, I had no problem with libido. And now that I'm whatever age you are, I, like I'm not in the mood like I used to be. Let's put this into context, shall we? Why did I have no problems with sex and libido at 21, but now at 41 married with a full-time job, two kids, a huge to-do list, all the obligations, hormonal changes, an extra 15 pounds around my waist, a pandemic, can I not get in the mood and have lost all desire? It's all about context. It's all about context. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just a lot has changed, including your hormones. And we're going to work through that. So what hormones affect your system? All of them. All of them. Testosterone, of course, gets the biggest um, play, right? Airtime. But all of them can affect your libido. So estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, your catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. These are all the ones we're going to talk about. So first, we're going to talk about the sort of like the what and the how. No, no, the what, yeah, the what, the what and the why. And then we're going to talk about the how. So like what hormone is affecting and then how do I do something about it? How do I test and do something about it? So let's start with the HPA axis. So I have this slide, I have a lot on these slides because I'm trying to... Um, use them more as a reference for you. So when you look back at these slides, you won't have to think to yourself, what was it that Carrie said? You can go, oh, I'll just go to the slide because there it is. So why would an elevated stress hormone cause you not to be in the mood? Well, it's hard to be in the mood when you're in fight or flight, right? And it can indicate that other things are going on, such as inflammation or blood sugar issues. If you have an elevated cortisol awakening response, one of the big triggers is anticipatory stress. Well, it's hard to be in the mood when you constantly have anticipatory stress. We know that stress interferes with thyroid and thyroid plays a big role in libido. And we know high stress can affect your production of serotonin. It can lower it. 
Now you're low mood and you have poor sleep because serotonin also makes melatonin and you're tired. So you have low mood and you're tired and you're stressed. And of course, you're not going to be in the mood. Now, what if you have low levels of your stress hormones? Now it's hard to be in the mood when you're tired, right? A low cortisol awakening response can indicate psychological burnout. A lot of people are going through this right now, so they're not going to be in the mood. I would say um, I'm getting asked a lot about, uh, when it comes to pandemic stuff, I'm getting asked about, um, why is my cycle weird? Why is my hair falling out? And where did my libido go? (laughs) It seems to be the big questions I'm getting. And it's because our brain is on constantly, constantly scanning for threat because we keep telling it there's threat. We keep hearing there's threat. We keep reading there's threat. And when there's threat, it can often shift our libido to the negative. And we know, again, that cortisol affects thyroid and therefore on testing, it can let you know, give you an indication if you're just looking at cortisol, especially on the Dutch test, that there's a thyroid problem. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes that I pulled out of this study uh, from 2009. Chronic stress, if continued for a long time, can damage many parts of the body. A significant part of the damage is due to the effects of a sustained norepinephrine release because of norepinephrine's general function of directing resources away from maintenance, regeneration, and reproduction and towards systems that are required for active movement. How many of you right now or how many of your patients are struggling to maintain, to regenerate, or to reproduce or all the things that go with reproduction, even just having a normal cycle, a healthy cycle, or libido? Probably a lot. Probably a lot. Norepinephrine is literally shifting the pathway towards active movement and away from these things because maintenance, regeneration, and reproduction are not a priority when there is a threat. And so as a result, it can induce sleeplessness, loss of libido, GI issues, impaired disease resistance, slower rates of injury, healing, depression, and increased vulnerability to addiction. So we have to take care of our stress. So ask your patients, ask yourself, when you go on vacation with your partner all alone, no kids, no family, nothing, how is your sex drive? I asked this to a friend of mine who is an amazing doctor down in California the other day who said, I have no sex drive. I said, what happens when you go on vacation with your partner alone? And he was like, oh my gosh, it's like the honeymoon. I was like, well, problem solved. <laughs> like, I, it's, it's not a hormone thing. <laughs> it's, it's a stress thing. You've got a lot going on in your life right now. And if you could go on vacation, I would recommend it. But unfortunately, you can't. So we're going to have to work on stress reduction. Here's an example. 35-year-old female, anxiety, high stress, PMS, low libido. Unfortunately, she lost her job due to the pandemic. She's worried about money and health. And as a side note, not shown here in the results, her luteal phase progesterone is low. These are Dutch results. These are actually a sneak peek of new the new types of dials that are going to be coming out, hopefully at the end of 2020. Um, But the dials are read like a gas gauge. So in between the star are the upper and lower range. You'll see the blue... um, the blue line is connecting, and then the gauge has an arrow on it. In this case, everything is really, really high. She has high free cortisol, high metabolized cortisol. The graph on the left-hand side, she should be in the blue shaded area. She's not. She's quite elevated. And this is what is causing and result of anxiety, high stress, PMS, and low libido. If you forgot how cortisol affects hormones, such as progesterone, I have a nifty little graph here to remind you. Um, Remember, glucocorticoids can inhibit the GnRH pulses out of the brain. So GnRH comes out of the hypothalamus, and then that tells the pituitary to make LH for uh, progesterone and FSH for estrogen. And if you have lots of glucocorticoids, then you will get a reduction in LH and FSH. And if you've completely forgotten, I have a little reminder slide right here for you. So your FSH is dominant in the early follicular phase, and these pulses are lower and slower, whereas LH, of course, is dominant in the late follicular phase to get you to ovulate, and then in the luteal phase, they're faster and higher to stimulate progesterone. Um, So, oh, you know what I've said to stimulate? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. To stimulate, to stimulate, uh, LH stimulates progesterone. When you have a lot of cortisol, what it will do is it will start to suppress the GnRH pulses, which will suppress the high ones first. So there goes LH, comes down. Therefore, progesterone tends to go down first and FSH is left. So they become estrogen dominant in the luteal phase. 
Or sometimes it's strong enough, it will suppress both FSH and LH, and now they have uh, amenorrhea, or maybe they're really late, they have a late cycle. But for people who experience a lot of stress and are having a lot of issues right now, um, the glucocorticoids play a big role in how these pulses are affected. So in her case, that super high cortisol she had from anxiety and being let go, suppressed her LH resulting in low progesterone. And as we know, low progesterone can increase anxiety and PMS, as can high cortisol. Now, over time though, high cortisol can result in low cortisol. It's a feedback loop to um, um, that uh, the, the high cortisol will go up to the GnRH, up to the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus will go, wow, that's a lot of cortisol. Let's cut this down. And then it will over time, over time, over time, start to drop that cortisol. So if you see somebody with low cortisol, keep in mind it was probably high cortisol, you know, not that long ago. So it looks like this, stressors, inflammation, infection that are chronic, inhibit the hypothalamus, inhibit the pituitary, and that lowers cortisol. Here's your example of that. This is a 42-year-old female, exhausted, low libido. She's a high school teacher for almost 20 years, very stressful. Her mother died last year. She's the primary caregiver. She said, I want it, I'm 42 and I want to be pregnant, but I'm feeling menopausal. Why do I feel menopausal? Why am I so exhausted? Why do I have low libido? I said, because your, your cortisol was high for so long and over time the feedback loop kicked in and now your cortisol is low. Does she have hope? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We just have to work on stress response and getting her feeling less threatened and then um, that'll help negate the feedback loop. What about men? Can't forget about our men. Now, keep in mind, those same um, glucocorticoids can affect the GnRH pulses for men as well. But when we look at men, this is a graph of testosterone production on the bottom um, uh, is time of day. And then on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see that's, that's the testosterone um, amount. And you'll see that testosterone is at its highest in this at about seven o'clock in the morning. So for those who don't know, testosterone is made in night. It is made during sleep. And that's why when you test testosterone, you especially want to make sure that they test um, first thing in the morning. You don't want to test a man's testosterone like in serum. You don't want to do it in the afternoon because in this example, look at like noon, noon and beyond, um, you can see their t his testosterone. Well, this is a study that goes, the, their group goes down pretty collectively. So you want to catch that peak. And that peak of testosterone is also why they have morning erections, right? I mean, they get them through the night, men get them through the night, but that the morning erection is because their testosterone is surging and then gradually declines throughout the day. But as I said, strongly tied to REM cycle sleep, therefore circadian rhythm is very important. If you're a man, or your patient, yourself, uh, are not getting very good sleep, you're staying up late, you're watching shows on Netflix you shouldn't be, you are working, you're on your phone and you're not getting very good sleep, it's going to affect your testosterone production. Daytime testosterone levels in this very small study were decreased by 10 to 15% when young men were cut to just five hours per night. Now there were only 10 men in this sample, but working for a lab and seeing lots and lots and lots, well, thousands and thousands and thousands of labs, I can attest to you that lack of sleep definitely affects men's testosterone. And how many men do you know will tend to stay up till midnight, one in the morning, and then they'll get up five, six, seven in the morning and uh, do it all over again, and they don't feel that well. Maybe they can get away with it when they're younger. Sure catches up to them when they're older. Higher levels of epinephrine is associated with lower levels of circulating testosterone. And in this study, 2000, uh, this quote from the study, penile erection is regulated by two opposing system. The anti-erectile or the noradrenergic, that's your norepinephrine and your epinephrine. What's pro-erectile? You want that nitric oxide. A very good friend of mine and men's health expert, Dr. Ralph Esposito, always says epinephrine is the killer of erections. So men with a lot of epinephrine or epinephrine floating around, it can cause problems. And that will definitely not get you a baby if you cannot have an erection. Estrogen. Elevated estrogen in women often results in, you know, unsexy estrogen dominant symptoms and elevated estrogen affects tryptophan, which will then affect serotonin, which will then affect melatonin. Low estrogen can, of course, uh, result in unsexy low estrogen symptoms, vaginal dryness, atrophic vaginitis. 
And stimulation of estrogen receptors in the brain is important for serotonin production and subsequently melatonin. So this can affect mood, motivation, arousal. It does also impact dopamine production um, and uh, synthesis and binding. So it's like, um, I say this all the time, it's like Goldilocks. We want estrogen to be you know, high when it's supposed to be and low when it's supposed to be, um, but too high or too low can definitely result in unhealthy sensations. Estrogen is very important in men. It's their estrogen receptors, ER, estrogen receptor, located all over in the brain, in the penis, in the testicles, in the adipocytes. Estrogen is important, just like Goldilocks, the right amount. It helps modulate his libido, erectile function, and sperm production. Men with low estrogen can have mood issues, depression, lack of focus, hot flashes, bone loss, loss of muscle mass, and sexual dysfunction. Sounds a lot like low T, right? So we don't want to miss this. Men who have low estrogen are also, you know, like it says bone loss, osteoporosis. Men can get osteoporosis, osteopenia. So we have to be careful not to completely suppress estrogen in men. What is very common though in men is estrogen dominance. As men age above 50, prostate levels of estradiol gradually rise and levels of progesterone and testosterone decline. The decline in testosterone and progesterone levels is greater than the rise of estradiol Estradiol and DHT are synergistic in creating prostate problems. So we always keep an eye on estradiol in our men, as well as testosterone, because for prostate health, but of course, we also know estrogen, too much estrogen, can increase um, a man's waistline and breast development. High estrogen in men can also make him moody, but more on the crying, depressed, weepy, not motivated, and less on the angry. High estrogen in women can make them... um, you know, they get that angry PMS. Men get, tend to be more uh, depressed and weepy. With men, we look a lot at aromatase. Um, if you're into genetics, that's your CYP19A1. This is what converts your androgens into your estrogens. And while aromata- aromatase are in multiple tissues, it's in the fat tissue and the adipocytes that we tend to focus on uh, because it's so heavily concentrated there. For those men, what upregulates aromatase? Excess alcohol, that's why we call it the beer belly. Zinc deficiency, insulin resistance, inflammation, central obesity, stress, high leptin, leptin resistance, aging, and gonadotropins. So a lot goes into aromatase. And I think we wait until the how part to talk about aromatase. Don't worry, I cover it. What does over-aromatization look like on the Dutch test? This is just an example. This is a man in his 40s. He was put on testosterone injections weekly because he was complaining of poor erections, low libido, and fatigue, except he says, I now have weight gain. I still have poor erections, low libido, and fatigue. What is going on? All that testosterone has to go somewhere. So again, these are read like a dial. In between the star are the upper and lower range. And you can see a lot of red. His testosterone is in the red because of his injection. His E1 and his E2 are also in the red because that testosterone has to go somewhere. Now, with testosterone injections um, and, and aromatase, this increased aromatization, in his case, what we suggested was either lower, lowering or spreading out his testosterone injections and then doing some um, anti-aromatizers, which I'll, I'll show you when we get to the house section. Let's talk about progesterone. Why is low progesterone a problem in women? Low levels can result in relative estrogen dominance in the luteal phase. And low levels can result in low neurosteroids. We know that as progesterone becomes a metabolite, it becomes what's known as allo, A-L-L-O, not like the plant allo, but allo, the neurosteroid. Allo crosses the blood-brain barrier and supports your GABA-A receptors in your brain. If you have healthy functioning GABA-A receptors, then you are going to feel more relaxed. You will have better sleep. You will feel calm. Side note, if you do not have uh, proper functioning GABA-A receptors, you're more at risk for PMDD. There's a lot of research out right now on this alpha pregnenolone um, metabolite, the allo, and its effect on those GABA receptors that are not working that well. But if they're working well, it can definitely help with um, uh, PMS. This is why progesterone is so important. And on the Dutch test, we look at one of the alpha metabolites right before it gets to allo. We look at alpha pregnanodiol. So on the Dutch test, I can tell you if your patient is more of an alpha person and they're less likely to experience anxiety and insomnia. Doesn't mean not likely, but they're less likely. 
my own results. I'm an extremely beta person on testing, which is so funny to me because I feel like a very alpha person in real life. But my beta enzyme is very, very upregulated. It's just genetic. Um, and so when I eventually get into perimenopause and menopause, my poor husband, because my anxiety and insomnia and calmness will not be that great. So I will be working very hard to increase my, my alpha side of my progesterone because I want to be calm and I want to have good sleep. All right, let's talk about testosterone. Low testosterone in women, testosterone comes from primarily the ovaries and the adrenal glands. Ladies, please keep this in mind. Um, I know this is about making a baby, but as women get into perimenopause and menopause and their ovaries start to lose follicles and aren't working, you're gonna lose about 25% of your testosterone production right there. Roughly 25% of your testosterone is made in your ovaries. Likewise, if your adrenal glands, that communication to your adrenal glands is not that great, if the feedback loop is kicked in and the ACTH is low, then you're going to lose testosterone production out of there. So we looked at two primary places for testosterone. Testosterone can also be made in fat tissue, um, but unfortunately, the more fat tissue you have does not equate to the more testosterone you have. Testosterone can be converted into, or excuse me, um, uh, women. It can be converted into testosterone from androstenedione and adipose tissue, like I said. It enhances dopamine release in the brain. So we like testosterone for the brain. Although unclear, a few studies have shown testosterone can suppress an overactive HPA axis. So testosterone in women might actually be uh, calming and soothing, believe it or not. We kind of think of testosterone as like anger inducing. That's actually DHT, it's metabolite. Testosterone is both anxiolytic and antidepressant effects, depending where it's binding. So GABA A or your serotonin receptors. And my question, is testosterone 100% correlated to sex drive or arousal? Of course not. We know it's so much bigger than that. And this is what low androgens look like on the Dutch test. What about testosterone in men? So men are a little different. 95 plus percent of their testosterone are made in the testicles. Men, 80% of their DHEA and uh, 20%, or, um, to, excuse me, back up. 80% of their DHEA and 100% of their DHEA S, S is the sulfated form, are made in the adrenal glands. 20% of the DHEA are made, no S, not sulfated, which is the active form, are made in the testicles. So when you're looking at DHEA, the active form, no S, not sulfated, majority is adrenals, a little bit's in the testicles. But all that testosterone is made in the testicles. Low testosterone symptoms are pretty common in men, right? They increase uh, belly fat, they have bone loss, low energy, low sex drive, low muscle mass, brain fog, mood issues, gynecomastia, and erectile dysfunction. Again, I show you the picture of testosterone just to reiterate and hit home. It is made at night and it is highest there early in the morning. What about oxytocin for men and women? Why would I bring up oxytocin? Well, it's the hormone associated with love, attachment, and bonding. Remember, this is how to make a baby when you're not in the mood. So if oxytocin is healthy, it downregulates the sympathetic nervous system and pushes for the parasympathetic if it's healthy, it reduces amygdala activity. Amygdala is part of your limbic system. It has to do with fear and anxiety, which is probably very triggered right now. Sexual application appears to have a greater effect in men, though. Oxytocin, when they're looking at studies of uh, giving oxytocin, it does tend to have a better effect in, um, for men as compared to women. It can help improve orgasm and the feelings of sexual satisfaction afterwards because, of course, it's known as the cuddle hormone. Oxytocin can be compounded at a compounding pharmacy. Um, it's often done as a nasal spray, but it can be done, I think, sublingually. Um, but it's the nasal spray that they've done in studies, and they found that it has the greater effect in men. So the men who are not so cuddly, they're not so good with attachment and bonding, that the oxytocin really helped them with women. Um, women better to get oxytocin. Um, uh, through, other, through other natural means, which I'll show you when we get to the how section. So when we're looking at hormones, we have adrenaline versus oxytocin and endorphins. So adrenaline is fight or flight, your muscles tighten, energies get sent to the limbs, increase sensitivity to pain. Definitely doesn't put you in the mood. Oxytocin and endorphins, muscles relax, energy sent to the uterus, decrease sensitivity to pain and awareness. This is your love hormone, right? Oxytocin, endorphin definitely helps put you in the mood. Let's talk about right now and we'll, we'll get into the how. So right now the world is struggling with illness, separation, social, in, uh, social isolation, financial insecurity, 
bereavement and death that will lead to a fallout with chronic conditions. So definitely for you as healthcare practitioners, I want you to realize the importance of everything happening right now in 2020 and how it's affecting our hormones. Um, but what, more importantly, the fallout that's going to happen in the future. What happens in 2020, you're going to be asking your patients about in your intakes in the future. You're going to be asking people who are young adults and kids now as they get older, how did you handle 2020? What happened for you in 2020? Because this is going to affect not only things like making a baby, but what that baby looks like. So definitely please keep this in mind when you're addressing your patients. So let's talk about the amygdala. This is the, the, limb, the limbic part of your body, right? That reptilian part. While many areas of the brain are involved with anxiety um, or fear-related information processing, the amygdala plays a huge role in emotion-based memory processing, your emotion around memory. So fear, anxiety-related emotions, PTSD. Now, the amygdala does other cool stuff, emotional intelligence, social interactions, including personal space, modulation of aggression, alcoholism and binge drinking. But what we're gonna focus on are those emotional-based uh, memory processing. So where's the amygdala? Smart, the body is smart. It says, you know what? I'm gonna put you right at the end of the hippocampus. I'm gonna put you right there so the hippocampus can, and I can talk to each other. It has a major influence on the HPA and on the gut-brain access. Why do we have the amygdala? Because when we are walking alone, social distancing in the forest at night on a misty night and this dude pops up we want to know and feel fear and decide to run it heightens our awareness to protect ourselves that's what the amygdala does we need our amygdala to tell us to run and to tell us to take care of ourselves what's the problem with the amygdala though <laughs> it is going to kill that libido uh, it's going to affect a lot of other things and how we respond to stress but uh, it's definitely going to kill that libido. And especially now, I brought up that slide about currently everything we're going through because our amygdalas are getting more uh, trigger happy or trigger sensitive. Let's not say happy, trigger sensitive. So people are going to feel more fear and anxiety and more stressed faster because of neuroplasticity. Basically, the amygdala is getting um, primed and trained to divert to fear, anxiety, threat, to protect myself faster than maybe it did in 2019. So we have to always, always, always keep this in mind um, when we're talking about people and our patients and how we're helping them handle their stress response and how they take care of themselves. Because we're talking about libido, but it definitely affects uh, the, greater, the greater person or the greater, um, the greater system. So dopamine and serotonin for men and women, Dopamine release increases attraction to our mate. It helps us feel motivated and have more energy. It gives us that high from all aspects of sex. So think about when you were first dating your partner or anybody. It's the fantasy. It's the daydreaming. It's the hoping and waiting and wishing that they're going to call. It's the text they're going to get. It's the excitement, right? It's also pornography. That all stimulates dopamine. No, you can't just take L-DOPA and suddenly be attracted to your mate. I get asked this a lot as well, um, where people go, well, can I just take a supplement for that? I'm like, no, no. Are you serious? If I, could, if I could just give you a supplement to be attracted to your mate and get your dopamine back, I'd be rich, rich. And I would just not hold back. I would just tell you what the supplement is. We would all take it as a, as a, as a community and we would all feel so much better. But there's no such thing. We have to work to get our dopamine up. So dopamine release, um, we like, but serotonin is the opposite. Serotonin, low serotonin associated with depressive feelings, high serotonin, hypoactive sexual uh, dysfunction. Where do you hear of high serotonin? Your patient's taking SSRIs. Why do people who are on SSRIs have low libido? Hypoactive sexual dysfunction because high serotonin directly inhibits your SES, your excitatory system. These people cannot get excited sexually with an SSRI. So let's summarize and we'll move into the how. Lust, libido, per the paper below, so your sex hormones are up, this is what lust is. Attraction is dopamine. Some research also says an increase in norepinephrine and a decrease in serotonin. Attachment is oxytocin. And then I mean, all the pictures in the brain of where we're looking. So it's all very brain related, right? We've got hormones, 
we have dopamine, we have serotonin, norepinephrine, oxytocin. So you can see how all these hormones, it's when somebody says libido, like what part of libido? Is it lust? Is it attraction? Is it attachment? What, what part of libido are we going for here? Last thing before we get into the how, please understand unrealistic social media. Stop comparing yourself to others. It results in low self-esteem, low mood. This is not helping your sex drive, your self-worth, or your feelings of desire. There are good studies on this to show what social media is doing to us. One, as far as stress. Two, as far as our sleep. Three, as far as our self-worth. And four, this all affects our libido, right? It's not going to really put us in the mood if we're constantly comparing against two other people or if we're feeling inadequate because of what we see on social media. So here's your public service announcement that you are enough, get off social media or limit it, limit your social media. So where do you start? Let's jump into the how section because this is the good stuff. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to talk about sex. Be the practitioner that talks about sex. Your patients will appreciate it. Talk about them. So there's sex, arousal, and orgasm. Get a thorough history. Address their lifestyle, their stress, their sleep. Work up pain if it's an issue. And remember, men have pelvic pain too. Strongly consider testing like the Dutch test. Supplemental support, BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy as they need it. Counseling and emotional work and maybe prescribe him, her, them a vacation with no family once we're allowed to go on vacation again. How? How do I? All right. I talked so much about the brain, right? So much about the brain between the amygdala, between the neurotransmitters. So let's start with the brain. You have to follow a strict circadian rhythm. I, my patients are like, that's too easy. <laughs> but when the, when it's circadian rhythm is a hundred percent, um, dictated by your clock genes, C L O C K clock genes, your clock genes are 100%, uh, affected by light and dark light entrains the clock gene dark resets a dysfunctional circadian rhythm so i want you as practitioners telling your patients to wake up and get full spectrum light exposure and when you go to bed sleep in complete darkness you're going to get uh, the gut healthy and you're going to work on that vagus nerve we want that vagus nerve for parasympathetic help through the rest of the body we also want to improve blood flow and oxygen in the brain how do we do that this is pretty Self-explanatory, I have a list. This is not an extensive list. This is just to just remind you of some things in case you're out of ideas. Obviously, exercise, stopping smoking, normalizing blood sugar, because all that glucose gums up the works in the tiny capillaries. Neurofeedback, biotuning, cranial sacral work, energy work, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, lymphatic work. All of you who are watching this webinar right now, pull your shoulders down out of your ears. You are stressing when you're up like this and now the blood flow can't go from your brain down to the lower part of your body. And as we know, hormones travel through the circulatory system. So treat it well. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, especially those who have suffered from a, a traumatic brain injury, a TBI, but it, they don't have to. The uh, hyperbaric oxygen is wonderful. Testing them for iron overload, including men. And um, I know this is about making a baby, but your menopausal women so men don't bleed and menopausal women don't bleed. So check, make sure you check their iron, their ferritin. And if it's elevated, yes, ferritin can be an inflammatory marker. It could also be an indicator of hemochromatosis. And those iron deposits can deposit in the brain tissue and cause issues. Be aware, please, of EMFs and cell phones to the head. Obviously, a lot of the studies are on rats. But still, if you've ever held your phone up to your ear because you can't find your headphones or, you, you know, whatever you're using, and after the fact, like... Um, like I had to do it yesterday. I had my phone up to my ear. I should have put it on speakerphone. I don't, I don't know why that didn't dawn on me. But anyway, I had it to my phone, my ear for probably a good five to six minutes. And my ear was throbbing. My jaw was super tense on the, on the right side. And I thought, oh my gosh, imagine the people that talk with their phone up to their ear all day long. You have to be very careful. So then brain supplements. Um, I have a lot of information with these supplements and in the interest of time, um, and because you get all the slides, I'm going to just sort of hit the high points because um, a lot of these are supplements you're probably familiar with, but I just have extra information on how it supports the brain. So Bacopa is probably one of my favorites for reducing brain inflammation, improving cognition, decreases hyperactivity, increases attention, and increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. Cordyceps, wonderful, increased learning and memory um, for ENOS as well, GABA and glutamate in the brain. It helps balance GABA and glutamate. 
your omega threes. Omega threes are just really good in general because all your cells have a lipid bilayer. So let's make that lipid bilayer fluid. Omega three fatty acids, of course, also reduce inflammation. Rosemary. If you're going to if you're going to pick a spice, use rosemary because it has quote cognitive enhancing powers. Who doesn't want that? So rosemary oil, use rosemary, um, the herb, rub it between your hands, smell it before you have to do anything brain functiony, before you have to take a test, before you read a paper, before you go in with a complicated patient. Um, I should have told you to smell rosemary before this webinar. That probably would have helped. Rosemary has a number of other awesome things like protecting against lipopolysaccharide damage, and it inhibits TNF-alpha and IL-6. Ginkgo, ginkgo is a really common one. I think um, bacopa, as far as brain power works better, um, just in my experience, especially with downstream hormone stuff. But uh, ginkgo also increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor. PQQ, PQQ is often, you'll see it in mitochondrial supports. It's often paired with CoQ10. Um, again, because we want the mitochondria. Did you guys know that the first step for all hormone production is actually in the mitochondria? So the star protein binds to cholesterol. Um, at, oh, you know what? I have a slide on it. Hold that thought. We were going to get to it in just a second. I forgot. I added the slide in because it's that important. Maca. Maca in some studies is shown to reduce ACTH and thus cortisol having antidepressant effects. And I know so many people love maca for its support for male and female hormones. So let's mitochondria. Here's a slide. Let's see here, do I have the circle? I do. All right, there's circled in the lower right-hand corner in the red. So the star protein binds to the cholesterol. That is the first um, step for all sex hormone or uh, steroid hormone production. In the mitochondria, pregnenolone is the first step along the way. Then it leaves and goes into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum where it can make testosterone and estradiol. To make cortisol though, the pregnenolone turns into something else which comes back into the mitochondria. So the cortisol is very, very dependent on mitochondria. So we think of mitochondria as ATP production, which it is, but it is also very, very important for hormone production. So get your mitochondrial healthy for your patients struggling with male and female hormone health issues. Testing and addressing stress. We've talked about the Dutch test, but just in case you came in late to this, you have two options. You have the Dutch complete, which is the dried urine uh, test, where we look at all the hormones, the metabolites, the some organic acids, things like melatonin, 8-OHDG, which is an inflammatory DNA damage marker, um, and more. This is what the typical traditional four-point collection looks like. So you collect in the morning, you collect couple hours later, you collect in the afternoon and you collect at night. And we're looking to see what that circadian rhythm is. We're looking to see how well your clock genes are functioning and how well the light dark is working for you. But if you want to get a little more specific, then we get into the Dutch plus, which is where we use the combination of dried urine and saliva. The point of the saliva is we give you all the hormones plus the cortisol awakening response. The cortisol awakening response looks like this, um, which looks kind of the same, but it's really a zoomed in focus right there in the morning. You collect in waking, you collect 30 minutes later, and you collect 30 minutes after that. Remember, start asking your patients, how long does it take you feel, to feel awake and alert in the morning? Ask yourself this. If it's more than 30 minutes, you know their awakening response is off. And if it's hours, it's really off. So you're going to start addressing the HPA axis. You always start with the brain. You're going to consider adaptogens, B vitamins, vitamin C. Vitamin C is a very potent antioxidant right in the adrenal gland itself. Remember that cortisol is made primarily in the mitochondria. So there's the step in the mitochondria that's first. It goes out to the endoplasmic reticulum and comes back in. You want to use that light dark for circadian rhythm entrainment and resetting. You want to consider all therapeutic recommendations to be within the first 30 minutes because that's when the cortisol awakening response kicks off. So when you are looking at whatever adaptogen you give them, whatever supplement you give them, whatever um, breathing exercise or journaling or whatever you have them do, you want to have them try to do it in the first 30 minutes of waking because you want to impact the car as much as possible. And you want to work on any coping, coping strategies you have for them for the feelings of fear, threat, and burnout. Let's address estrogen. For men and women, let's talk about estrogen metabolism first. In my big three-hour lecture, where well, you will basically become an expert in estrogen metabolism, I have summed up that three hours in about three slides, maybe five. 
So this is the very quick version. When you learn estrogen detoxification, you learn it as phases one, two, two and a half, and three, but you always address it as three, two and a half, two, one. So phase one are your cytochrome P450. That's where it's in the liver. Phase two is your COMT. Phase two and a half is your bile. And phase three are your, is your intestines. Why do you address it with phase three first? Because the intestines is the gateway out of your body. So I want to make sure that gateway, that sewer line is open and clear and moving first before I go up the chain of detoxification. Open the bottom before you start working at the top. Don't just put everybody on DIM or indole-3-carbonyl. That works specifically for phase one estrogen detoxification. If they have a phase one problem, it's a very good product. But what if their problem is phase two or phase three? You have to work on that first. DIM also upregulates 1A1 for everything. We are just talking about it as estrogen. But remember, lots of things go through 1A1, like polyaromatic hydrocarbons. If you upregulate your polyaromatic hydrocarbons with DIM and you don't address COMPT or the intestines, then those phase one metabolic polyaromatic hydrocarbons just float around and cause damage. We think of it as estrogen. It is still a SNP that affects so many other things. Open phase two and phase three. How do you evaluate estrogen? These are the new coming dials for the Dutch test. We have E1 and E2 at the top. Phase two along the left-hand side, you have your two, your four, and your 16 hydroxy pathways. These are your phase one pathways. In this example, the 16 pathways up in the red, the 16 is proliferative. It's very estrogenic. Your two pathway is the ideal pathway that you want to go down. It's less carcinogenic. The middle pathway is the four pathway. The four pathway is more carcinogenic. How do you evaluate phase two metabolism? This is where you look at their COMT, their COMPT. We're looking to see the ability of the body to get from hydroxy to methoxy. Basically, it gets neutralized here. So we want to do all the things to support COMT. On the Dutch test, we give you a methylation activity sort of, we, we, it's, we just give it to you. We just tell you. In this case, the person is low. They have low methylation activity. We do not test COMT, but we do test the activity of the pathway. How do you increase support and love on COMT? Well, we're looking at methyl donors and we're looking at that homocysteine methionine cycle. So if you Google image methionine cycle, it's all those coenzymes that you're going to look at. So magnesium and SAMe are number one and number two. Trimethylglycine, which is known as betaine, methionine, your choline, your methylated B vitamins, zinc, all of these are the coenzymes to help that entire circle go round and round. There are a lot of things that slow down COMT, so be very mindful of this when you're working with your patients. If they already have a slow CMT, don't make it slower, but if they have a normal functioning COMT, you can make it slower. So being on estrogen can slow it down. Having excess estrogen in the luteal phase can slow it down. Quercetin can slow it down. Bisphenol exposure can slow it down. So just be mindful of this. Phase three is out the gut and the astrobilome. The astrobilome is my favorite word in science, which I will say over and over and over again because it's so fun to say. It's the estrogen microbiome squished together, astrobilome. So address the gut microbiome. Do stool testing and see what's going on. And for diet, increasing fruits, veggies, and more importantly, fiber. Avoiding the standard Western diet. Be selective with antibiotic use. Reduce or eliminate alcohol. Alcohol absolutely affects the liver, but it absolutely affects the microbiome. Avoid and minimize toxicants. Consume pre, uh, prebiotics and resistant starches. Your probiotics and the supplement that's commonly used is calcium deglucurate. In the astrobilome is an enzyme known as beta-glucuronidase. Beta-glucuronidase is the problem child that's allowing estrogen to run free. So you have to do all the bullet points, the top bullet points first, whereas the supplement calcium deglucurate just stops beta-glucuronidase, the enzyme, from being a problem child. It doesn't lower it, it just stops its action. You still have to clean up the gut and affect its, and then, and affect its numbers so it'll stop its action. But the supplement's a great Band-Aid. So estrogen, progesterone deficiency in women with deficiency in women, um, obviously addressing the cause, referring to the brain slides and the mitochondria slides. 
Consider something like ovarian glandulars. DHEA, if you can prescribe it or use it, it can be very helpful. Estrogen replacement therapy, if warranted. But what else can support estrogen deficiency? Definitely some great uh, herbal examples. Ashwagandha, which is withania. Chase tree. Now, I know a lot of you are going to go, well, hold on, chase tree raises progesterone. Chase tree is like a really good ovarian adaptogen. I've been calling it an ovarian adaptogen for years and years and years because I found when I gave chase tree, it just sort of helped estrogen and progesterone together. So if you have low estrogen, I have found it to be useful. Angelica, semisifuga, tribulus, some of the phy other phytoestrogens, genistine, and then shatavari. So these can be helpful. Now, these do not necessarily raise estrogen, although I will say in a cycling woman, I've definitely seen chase tree like help in the process to get her ovaries working again. And I've seen um, Shadavari help to get the ovaries working again. But let's pretend she's menopausal, even though this is about making a baby. These do not cause the body to make more estrogen. They're phytoestrogens, to, to, some of them are, and they bind to the estrogen receptor and they can be very, 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 very weak estrogens. And that's how they can be supportive. They also, some of them have support for the HPA axis and some of them are very supportive to the brain which is also helpful for women with low estrogen. So progesterone. Progesterone women, number one, are they ovulating? Address the cause. Make sure they're not taking any pain medications within 10 days of ovulation because we know pain medications can suppress uh, the pulses out of the brain. See those brain support slides. Consider acupuncture and abdominal body work. Improve that blood flow uh, to the ovaries. Again, chase tree. Vitamin B6, tribulus, withania, which is ashwagandha, mitochondrial support, and consider ovarian glandulars. We're trying to get her ovulating again, but let's pretend she's ovulating, but she just can't quite produce progesterone. Her lutein cells, her corpus luteum is not that strong. So address the cause. We're trying to get those LH pulses to be as strong as possible. So reduce her stress, use the brain slides, use mitochondria slides, uh, use oils and omegas to your advantage. Look at her carotenoids. They are called lutein cells for a reason. They have that yellowish orange tint to them and they are high in lutein. Um, there is some research looking at beta-cryptoxanthine, but the research is mixed and it's, it's not, um, it's not, there's not a lot <laughs> if you look it up when it comes to lutein cells, but um, it's, you know, it's worth a shot. Everything's worth a shot. And it's a, it's a carotenoid, like that, it, that's good for the body. Other antioxidant support, since we know the ovaries are so impacted by uh, reactive oxygen species. Glandulars again, and then progesterone HRT if warranted and if you can prescribe it. What about progesterone and GABA? I talked about this in the beginning, um, but just in case uh, you came in late. So progesterone, it's the uh, alpha form, the ALLO, that crosses the blood-brain barrier and touches on the GABA-A receptors. So you can give GABA as a supplement as well if she's experiencing anxiety and can't sleep very well. There's mixed uh, theories on GABA, like, oh, GABA is too big of a molecule. It shouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier. If it does cross the blood-brain barrier, then GABA, then the blood-brain barrier is leaky and GABA shouldn't be crossing. Um, but I believe it's the paper, the 2015 paper I have listed there at the bottom. So it's saying that when you take GABA is a supplement, your enteric nervous system, basically your vagus nerve goes up to uh, your central nervous system and says, hey, make GABA. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So taking GABA, the supplement may have nothing to do with a leaky blood brain barrier, and it may just be a really great communicator through the vagus nerve. Um, and then how else do you support aloe? Uh, you can do oral and sublingual progesterone and pregnenolone uh, supplementation if you can prescribe that. Let's look at aromatase in men since we're still in the estrogen progesterone section. Typical aromatase inhibitors your patients will come in on or you might prescribe are anastrozole or letrozole. What supplements can you use? Uh, apigenin and other flavonoids have been shown in studies to be helpful. White button mushroom, which is agaricus. Yes, you can absolutely just eat white button mushroom. Um, I do find though that you, I mean, you'd have to probably eat your body's weight in white button mushroom to make it effective, but white button mushroom. Chrysin. Chrysin is mixed reviews. Um, it's tough to digest orally. So I do know that there are some companies and compounding pharmacists that will use Chrysin topically. Um, and then I have other, anecdotally, I have other practitioners that use Chrysin um, orally and say it works great that their men have low, uh, had high estrogen and now they have low estrogen. Genistein, grapeseed extract, and red wine procyanidin dimers have all been shown in research to help 
decrease the um, activity of the aromatase enzyme. And I have um, some of the research listed there. Let's get into androgens. Improving androgens in women, remember, they come from the ovaries and the adrenals. No, there is no test for me to tell you where the testosterone came from. If I check their testosterone in the Dutch test or in serum testing and they, I get a testosterone level, I can't tell you if that's from the ovary or uh, if that's from the adrenal gland. That There's no way to do that. I wish that would be really helpful. But regular HIIT training, weight training, put that lean muscle on her. That will help proper sleep and supporting her mitochondria. And then there are some supplements that in a, eh, mildly in research have shown to maybe be helpful, uh, but I have them listed there. So zinc, maca, tribulus, shadavari again, Tonkat Ali, which is in pine pollen, which are much more associated for men, um, much more studied in men, um, but showed mildish help in men. So I thought, well, if it's good in men, it's got to be good in women because it's modulating sex hormone binding globulin and testosterone binding to it. And then considering DHEA and or testosterone hormone replacement therapy for women. Androgens in men, speaking of which, when you have an androgen problem in men, is it a primary or secondary issue? So if you have a testosterone report on a man and his testosterone is low, you want to know if it's coming from the brain, coming from the testicles, or both. So primary is coming from the testicles. You will check a serum LH. If his serum LH is high, then you know it's a testicular issue because the brain is working fine. It's yelling at the testicles to make testosterone and they're not doing it. In secondary hypothyroidism, the LH is low and the testosterone is low. The brain is not giving the signal, therefore the testicles aren't responding. Unfortunately, mixed is harder to tell because you initially might think it's secondary and then realize as you do a lot of brain support that no, really it's a combination of both. The testicles aren't really responding either. If you need a little visual reminder, here's your visual reminder. Secondary is up in the brain. Therefore, um, always, always check LH. You want to make sure you check LH with low testosterone. Primary or down in the testicles. Now, you will notice that a lot of people, a lot of men who have low testosterone just immediately get put on testosterone and they never address any of the causes. Here is an entire list of causes that I want you as good practitioners to go through. Obviously, age, uh, can't do much about that. But, you know, checking their blood sugar and, sugar and insulin, looking at their SHBG, check their thyroid. Men absolutely get thyroid problems. Ask them about a history of traumatic brain injury. Check their zinc. Ask their honest alcohol and marijuana use. Have they, have they had a testicle removed? Talk to them about their hobbies, their exposures, what they use at home, what they do for work. Get their weight. Talk to them about their sleep. Do they have sleep issues, sleep apnea, snoring, disordered breathing? Are they on any medications such as opioid pain medications? Have they have, do they have a history of anabolic steroid use? Are they currently using antibiotic, anabolic steroids? Um, it's amazing what people forget to tell you, they forget to write down unless you actually out, outright um, you know, point it out to them. It's like when you ask a woman, are you on any medication? No. Do you take the birth control pill? Yes. <laughs> like that's a medication, hold on. Or you, do you take any medication? No. Do you take any pain things like Tylenol? Oh yeah, I take Tylenol pretty often. That's the medication. So definitely sometimes they point this stuff out to people. Less common causes, infarctions, you know, cancer, space occupying lesions, decreased blood flow to the glands, radiation, and chemo. Low testosterone for men, very similar with women, but exercising, lift weights, HIIT training, pack that lean muscle on that man. Lifestyle, sleep, and diet. Conventionally, what conventionally they're doing are just putting men right away on testosterone replacement. Maybe they'll give him HCG injections that acts like LH to tell the testicles to make testosterone. Sometimes they'll use HCG to tell the difference between primary and secondary if it's mixed. They'll give him HCG injections. If his testosterone goes up, they'll know it's testicular. Uh, Clomid is an estrogen modulator to increase LH and FSH. Micronutrients, natural treatment, again, zinc, vitamin D, B-complex, the mitochondrial support, A, C, and E, and selenium. So a lot goes into making testosterone, but it's made in the night. So definitely, definitely, definitely make sure he is getting sleep. There are some um, herbs that are studied. Tribulus, maca, are, I, we have question marks because the research isn't that strong. Much more anecdotal. Much more anecdotal where practitioners will say, my patient took tribulus, my patient took maca, and they felt really pretty good. Or that you're, or, um, you know, maybe you, you are male and you're telling me this. Long jack is urecoma. 
Fenugreek macuna makes dopamine. Ashwagandha and black seed actually have human research on them to show that it does help increase uh, testosterone production. And so those can be used. Fenugreek um, and macuna, I definitely see over and over again. Ashwagandha, we use it so commonly that I don't, I don't know that I would say men go on ashwagandha for stress or for thyroid and magically their testosterone goes up. Um, but it, I, it's just used all the time that I don't know that I see that correlation, but there's some studies on it listed there. Oxytocin for men and women, we're coming to the end. What increases oxytocin if you um, didn't look at that picture right there of that dog and not have oxytocin, there's something wrong with you. That's my dog, Hank. So I have to put my dog, Hank, um, in, in my lectures about oxytocin because I think he's the cutest thing. And that picture always increases my oxytocin. But physical touching, obviously it's really tough to do right now when you're you know, social distancing. But the people around that are in your house, hugging, kissing, cuddling those you love, this is the problem. This is a big problem with going, what's going on right now in social distancing. People aren't getting their oxytocin fix. Words of encouragement and appreciation raises oxytocin. So thank you guys so much for being on this lecture. I really, really, really appreciate it. And I encourage you to hang on to the end. See, your oxytocin just went up. And I showed you a picture of my dog. So double oxytocin. Genuine laughing, not just LOL. Meditation and prayer. Eat, drink, and be merry with your friends and family, but it's from, you know, six feet apart. Breastfeeding, sexual self-stimulation, and orgasm in general will increase oxytocin. Serotonin and dopamine in men and women. All right, what do you do with their dope, or excuse me, their serotonin is low? Well, address their estrogen because low and high estrogen, this is for men too, low and high estrogen will affect their serotonin production and low testosterone will affect their serotonin production. If they need it, you can consider 5-HTP um, to help the body get from 5-HTP, just, just give them 5-HTP so they make serotonin. Please watch if they are on an antidepressant um, you don't necessarily want to have them on an SSRI or SNRI and 5-HTP at the same time. Just be careful. And be aware that serotonin and dopamine use the same enzyme um, to convert forward. And so if you're using a lot of 5-HTP over time, you could deplete dopamine and you don't want to do that. High serotonin, like I said, it decreases the ability to, of the excitatory systems to turn on or work. And so think of those men and women on SSRIs or migraine medications that are serotonin based or some pain meds like uh, fentanyl and tramadol, those will raise serotonin. And so it is hard to tell on serotonin testing if their serotonin is high um, because it's mostly made in the gut. So usually it's, it's medication related, um, but if they're not on any of those medications and they have high serotonin, what can you do? Look at saffron. So if they have high serotonin, um, or they're on an SSRI, there are some good studies to show that saffron has been really helpful for improving libido for that person on an SSRI. And it's safe to be on saffron at, with an SSRI. So I have the um, dose for the concentrate in the whole plant. And when you buy it, make sure it's in the deep red color, just like this picture. That's the kind of saffron you want. So almost to the end, trying to increase dopamine. Like I said, there's no magic pill per se to get the central nervous system to make lots of dopamine so that you are, you know, in the mood and feeling lusty all the time. So you have to manage your stress, you have to manage your sugar, you have to manage your drinking. Uh, dopamine's about your vices, so you have to manage your vices. Vices work in the short term, but they can result in long-term downregulation of dopamine. So find other healthy vices exercise, get passionate about something. This is, people will ask me like, well, I've been married for 30 years. Like the passion's gone. <laughs> like you have, it takes some work, right? You got to get some passion back. And if you can't get the passion back with your partner right away, find passion in something else. Take up a hobby, get into painting, get into something gardening that you get very passionate about. And it often spills over into your partnership. Find other things, like I said, go on vacation without the kids, mix it up in the bedroom, get out of the rut and consider these supplements. So DLPA is D-L-phenylalanine, which is a high up precursor to dopamine, tyrosine, and then macuna. Remember, macuna can also help raise testosterone. And that's supposed to be 500 to 1,000 milligrams. I forgot my zero. It's not 500 to 100. <laughs> not backwards, 500 to 1,000. Although I will say in the testosterone study, if memory serves, the Macuna dose was five grams, five grams a day. It's a boatload of Macuna. 
to raise testosterone. Um, but just read that study, it can be helpful. So in summary, the libido has a break and an accelerator, which is gonna take much more than an hour and 15 minutes to walk, to break that down. But consider looking at that book. I have no financial interest. It was just very helpful to say like, hey, look, we have a sympathetic and parasympathetic for the central nervous system. Like you have one for libido too. And I was mind blown, like light went on, like, oh, right. That makes total sense. And everybody knows what their breaks are, right? When I asked my friends, when I was writing this study, like, do you know what your breaks are? They knew immediately whether it was about what they were worried about, what they were thinking about, their body consciousness, what their kid was doing, their husband did that thing that annoyed them, whatever it was, they would slam on the brakes and they weren't in the mood. And then they knew what their accelerators were. Some people don't, but some people, it's everything from some like um, their uh, love languages being met, you know, the dishes being done, the kids are out of the house, they got enough sleep the night before, they're feeling good about themselves. Like the accelerator can be just as varied as the break can be. Everything involves context. So when your patient asks you, why don't I have libido like I used to? It absolutely is hormones, but what has happened in that time frame, that time span is also big. Hormones play a big role in libido. I see the word might because sometimes I get pushed back where people go, hormones have nothing to do with libido. Like really? Because when we fix their hormones, we, when people feel good about themselves again, which usually involves hormones, oftentimes their libido improves. Stress, fear, and, uh, fear and survival negatively impact hormonal outputs and libido of both men and women. And like I said, is Dr. Esposito says epinephrine is the number one killer of an erection and it affects women as well. Tests don't guess. A lot of those symptoms were the same. Look at the symptoms of low estrogen and low testosterone in men, very similar. So know your patient's levels to be personalized. There's no magic pill for libido. I'm so sorry. It is a very top question that I get over and over and over again. It's probably a question you get over and over again. If I had the magic pill, I swear I would just give it to you. I would not hold back. A solid night's sleep goes a long way towards feeling refreshed and resilient, and that's what we're all trying to achieve right now. And it increases testosterone in men. So remember, practitioners, you have to take care of yourself first. So as Cruella is showing us, this is us trying to excel in our career, maintain a social life, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive and be happy, and have a libido, right? We're trying as best we can. So thank you so much, everyone. If you need more resources, we I've had a lot of Dutch examples in here. Dutch does test a lot of the hormones. Please ensure you have an account. We have the link there, the phone number. We do have a sign up for all new practitioners. You can receive up to 50% off your first five tests that you buy. So you can buy one test, two, three, four, five, and it will be 50% off. We also drop ship. You do not have to carry the tests in your clinic we can drop ship them right to your patient. So that concludes our talk. Thank you so much for listening. And I know it went over an hour. It went over an hour and 15. So worth it. So thank you, <laughs> Gary, thank you very much. So a few things, um, we're gonna do some questions. The replay will be back on Healthy Seminars. And for those that wanted the um, handouts, a lot of you wanted those handouts, um, email info at dutchtest.com and they will um, send you the handouts. So if you want to have those handouts, please do that. Um, let's do a few questions. So can we um, share the questions? There are some questions in the chat. And if you have, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask it verbally. But I know we collected a few questions in the chat. So if we can share that team and um, we can let um, Carrie go through that. All right. So, do, you, do, you to, do you want me to just read them or do you want to read them to me? Well, please read them. Go ahead. Do you ask these questions on a new patient initial appointment? I do uh, for libido. Um, I do if libido is a big part of why they're coming to see me. I will in my um, sort of hormone question, my general hormone questions for women um, and well, and men, but I, primarily women. Most men don't want to come see me about their libido but women will. So when they're talking about, I'm like, tell me about your cycle, tell me about this, how, you know, how long do you bleed? What's your PMS like? Blah, blah, blah. I will often ask, like, how is your libido? And if they're like, oh no, it's actually pretty good. We just keep going. And if they are super exasperated and roll their eyes and they say, what libido? Then I may start to ask some of the questions. Um, but if that's not what they're there to talk about at all, then I, then I don't. 
Um, could you touch on how and why antidepressants sometimes lower libido? It's serotonin. It raises serotonin. So excess, um, not serotonin syndrome, but having um, higher levels of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, cleft can um, inhibit the excitatory system for libido. And so we often think with antidepressants and libido, oh, it must be because of low serotonin, but it's actually uh, a little bit elevated serotonin. So that's where saffron, the slide on saffron is really helpful. And there, the research is on saffron and I believe Prozac, but I could be, yeah, I think it's Prozac, not Zoloft, but the research on saffron and antidepressants, they actually list what antidepressants they, um, in the human studies that they looked at, which is great. Can you talk about how accurate it is to measure progesterone metabolites in urine versus progesterone in serum and saliva? Yes, actually, in the very beginning, um, if you missed the beginning, I show the slide where in 2019, there was a study published that compared progesterone in saliva, or saliva in serum and progesterone in dried urine um, and showed a really great correlation. So that study was published in 2019. Um, but it was not compared against saliva. So I don't know the comparison between progesterone in um, urine and saliva. That hasn't been studied yet. But serum in urine, I have in, the, when you get the slides, you'll see it in the beginning. Uh, oh, the, I should keep reading. The functional nutrition class I taught that saliva and serum are more accurate for measuring progesterone. There's a study on it. So I would, I, that, yeah, there's a study on it. Um, any experience with, oh, she writes, uh, French maritime, French maritime pine bark. Yes. Why do I use French maritime pine bark? With endometriosis, is that why I use it? I have to look it up in my notes. I don't use French maritime pine bark, I don't think, in, in general for women's health. Not because I don't like it. I just don't know enough about it. Um, but I think I use it for women with endometriosis. And then somebody else said um, for erectile dysfunction. I've never used it with erectile dysfunction. That's super good to know. I'll have to look that up. In your experience, can treating high stress alone help the ovaries to respond ovulating again when FSH is elevated if perimenopause is ruled out? Yes, yes. Now, in every single woman, no. <laughs> but yes, if, um, I, if high stress is, a, is, is the culprit, you test, her cortisol is high. She's like, yep, I'm super stressed out. Here's what's been going on. Her ovulation is a mess. Her cycles are a mess. Oftentimes, now I will, people, well, I, can I treat both? Yeah, absolutely. You can totally address the ovaries just as much as you can address the stress. But if maybe finances are an issue and you can only pick one, you can absolutely just start with the stress. Um, and um, that'll help that feedback loop and the GNRH pulses, which can then help the LH and the FSH pulses again. Does it sure. work every time? No, but it, it's a good start. This was excellent. I love this. I can't wait to review this again. The <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> is available. Well, you always deliver good material, Carrie. So not, not surprising. And the comments in the chat are they love they love the talk. So um, replay is available on healthyseminars.com. Um, the precision analytical link, you can get that through the calendar on the resources page. If you want these slides, then just email info at dutchtest.com. If you're wondering, is Dutch available? Um, in my country, my place, just contact them. They'll let you know um, where it's available. So you got the email, so please do that. A big thank you to Precision Analytic for sponsoring this. A big thank you for Dr. Kerry Jones for putting this material together. And a big thank you for you guys for coming together, listening, and bringing your questions. Now that we've all raised our oxytocin, we go have, we have to find somebody to uh, to to don't waste it, right? Right. <laughs> Good way to put that. I know. How do you put that PC? Good way to put it. Don't waste it. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your morning, evening, night, wherever you are from. Lauren, thank you, team. Thank you, Healthy Seminars. Mm -hmm.